World Financial Group offers entrepreneurs from all backgrounds the opportunity to start the World Financial Group offers entrepreneurs from all backgrounds the opportunity to start their own business on a level playing field. Dr. Yana Woodhouse, receiving the WCM Wall Street Pioneer Award by the United Black Wall Street of America, Inc., is one of those entrepreneurs. I see WFG and TFA as a place where African Americans with an entrepreneurial mindset can flourish. And the bonus, we help families and serve the communities across the country. To learn more about us, Go to worldfinancialgroup.com. We are the We are the sons and daughters of the soul. We are resilient and forever forward thinking. We ask for nothing else than the opportunity to live and to create the lives that we were meant to live. We want nothing but an equal chance at options and possibilities same possibilities and options to live out our potential as our fellow man. We want to be heard, understood, and expressive in our reality. We are the teacher. We are the creative. We are here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Bold Show with me, your host, Marie Dunn. Happy New Year. Can we still say that? I think it's still okay because I have not been in this space since 2022. So I'm really hoping that 2023 is off to an amazing start for everyone and that you're all looking forward to being your best selves, regardless of what's going on in your life. I'm just like always super grateful to be alive. Um, oftentimes we're so focused on like the great things and we're celebrating like when we have these big wins. But I'm here to remind you that you all should take a moment to celebrate the small things and the small miracles that's happening in our lives every single day. So as you all know that The Bold Show is here to have difficult and uncomfortable conversations, right? It's here to share the power of stories and also to empower, inspire, and impact others to share and be open and leaning into the pain that we all feel. Tonight, like all the other nights, I am super elated to have our special guest. And I'll start with a quote from her. Until women are valued, until women are sitting at decision-making tables, until Black women are protected, I will continue to play my part as an advocate for women, Jean Nangwala. She is a singer, speaker, creator, survivor advocate. She was born and raised in Zambia. Her passion for social justice stems from her personal experience of injustice and witnessing the same inequality across the globe. Her passion is empowering women to come together and alleviate systems that perpetuate social injustice. She loves using music and dance to inspire others to find liberation through their art. Tonight, we are gonna talk about sex. Welcome our guest, Ms. Jean Nanguala. Hi, hi, Marie. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here. So I'm going to put you in the hot seat. I shared all that beautiful stuff <laughs> from the bio, right? Why don't you tell the viewers who you really are? 
Oh, wow. You really decided to go for it. Okay. Um, I'm going to go right into it. <laughs> no problem. Well, my name is Jean Angwala and I'm a singer. I'm an artist. Like I do spoken word. I sing. I dance. That's how I express my voice. Um, I speak too as well. I am a very member Zambian woman. And yeah, my life is advocating and speaking on sexual violence, how we can alleviate sexual violence in our communities and organizations. Awesome. I love it. So I think this is our cue to show that wonderful um, YouTube video that you have. <laughs> so we're going to go right into it and then we'll d um, dive right into our conversations tonight. Sounds good. Thank you. Awesome. They say chin up and chest out. That's what a woman does or else the world will knock you out. I knew the world wouldn't protect me, so I learned to keep my guard up. But one place that felt I didn't have to have my guard up was in the church. I thought no one would ever harm me. Everyone is trustworthy and safe. So my guard was all the way down when he invited me to his place. He was admirable. He loved the Lord, he sang, he preached, he was noble. Everything my mama taught me that were qualities of a good man. He was safe, I thought. But there he was, his hands on me. I said no, but he was right there on top of me pulling at my skirt. I became 13 again, powerless again. Should I fight back? I was shocked last time I tried. Should I say no again? Maybe he did not hear me the first time, I thought. But here I am, laying here like wood. It will be over soon, I told myself. Just breathe. It will be over soon. He was done. He got up and left me. So hey, when you saw me at church the next day, angry and afraid, you ignored me. I wish you looked at me a little longer because you would have seen the sadness in my eyes. My sadness said more than my words could ever ex express. My tears, my self-sabotaging be behavior that you said was unlike me was a cry for help. But instead you excluded me because that is not what a child of God does. I wish your prayer was not a one-time occurrence that hit me with shame because my hurt didn't wash away immediately. I wish it was like a river flowing with patience and kindness. You were supposed to be my safe space. So I need you to understand that I could trust you again. I wish you you could acknowledge that you have been in an entangled relationship with a system that continues to save face instead of undoing the hurt. Power is used to manipulate instead of inspire. Religion to harm instead of heal. Something needs to change. So is this church a safe space for me? Oh... Is that just a children's tale?
that was moving. All right. And here we are. You're smiling. Mm -hmm. You're excited about life. Yes, 100%. <laughs> you're and you're sharing. And you're taking back the power. The power, sexual autonomy, just your overall independence. Before we could go any further, I must ask you, because you must have watched this several times. How does it make you feel like watching it now? Tell me about watching it now and when you first made it. Oh, wow. I think when I first made it, it was very like, I think I was still in my process of how do I communicate to an institution that I so am connected to, like the church Every I, I mean, from most of us, like, growing up when you were younger um like zambia is called a christian nation so when we're all growing up all we knew is church and thinking about that time when i was writing it was i really looked at everybody in this space as a safe space and it made me so angry it just fumed me listening to it now is a testament to it to just say oh wow like there's probably another girl out there feeling the same way, wanting a space to talk about this. And I think I trust that there's change that can be made now. It's like, I know people are ready to listen and do something about it. I must say, thank you for your bold, brash, audacious willingness yeah. <laughs> to fight back at a system. And I love how you talked about the church and how the church is, quote unquote, is supposed to be this safe space because yeah. there is so much trauma that's embedded in the church and the church mm -hmm. suppresses that. So I think it's like, this is a great segue into talking about the cultural suppression of black women's voice and their sexuality. Mm -hmm. what, what does that look like for you? Um, and then we could get into a little history around this. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I think thinking about it, like whether it's a church or work or school, there's all those rules. There's a way that you have to dress. If something happened to you, then your boobs were out. Like there's, there's always been something that brings back the shame to you. It's never the other person's fault. Uh, if you were raped, well, where were you? What time was it? Were you drinking? There's all these things happening at work. It's, are you sure this happened at work? Did, did your boss really? There's something. There's a reason that turns back the blame on you. And we just stay with the shame over and over. And expressing yourself feels a little hard. I remember the first time I um, experienced sexual violence in the church, I told a friend and my friend was like, well, but like, you're still very flirtatious and, you know, act sexy. Are you sure that happened? Because you should be hating men right now. You should. And I said, well, hold on. Are you telling me now I can't express myself? I can't walk a certain way. I can't wear certain clothes because that happened. Like I need to constantly walk with my head, you know, like looking down and with the shame of it all. That's when you will believe that I've been hurt. And I'm just like, no, if that shame really does not belong to me. And I don't know why I should be the person that needs to carry it over and over and over again. I don't know if that answered your question. It, 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 pretty, much, well. it pretty much does um, because I think black women, and I'll say black women, like we have been dealt such a, a, a harsh reality of what our lives really is. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with the Jezebel stereotype, right? have been sexualized a lot yeah we've been sexualized we've been objectified like this goes back to even before slavery right mm -hmm. 
And even going back to like, you know, now that you're, you're, you're from Africa, right? And I remember like back in the, before the 1800s, when the Europeans went to Africa, they were intrigued by the black women, right? Mm -hmm. So we're always um, an idea. There's always lust surrounding black women. And, you know, going back to your points, uh, saying that the shame is always placed back on us. It's always our fault. You were dressed a certain way. You were too seductive. Mm -hmm. Your skirt was too short, right? You were smiling a little bit too hard, right? It's okay if a white woman does that, right? Mm -hmm. But when a black woman does it. Like it's a little too much. You were looking at me a little too much. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So tell me what does, how do you define sexuality? What does that look like for you? Um, I always look back to my culture, which is more how we dance. It's, it's like through our waist and we love it. Like that to me, it's like dance, but it was also an, embody, an embodiment of just like beauty and strength. And it was like coming of age dance. There was so many things that now I look at it and it was like, it's sexualized. But back then it was like, this is a powerful way of like a woman is powerful. And I think looking at my sexuality, I'm just like, no, like that is an embodiment of my power. Like everything that makes me who I am, my sexuality, how I carry myself and dress and do my hair, everything is just a definition of the power that I bring into the space. So when I'm dancing, you see me on the dance floor, I don't want you looking at that as, oh no, she wants me. No, 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 really? My culture I dance like this as a celebration and a celebration of myself, my womanhood. Um, so for me, it's, I think it just really means the, the power I hold. Absolutely. I love that. I, I love that explanation because I think sex is such a taboo topic. Oh, yeah. People don't talk about it, but then we live in a society that's so sexualized, right? Yeah. So it makes you wonder and... Again, going back to when you talk about a system, is so much systemic issues and barriers um, and so many red flags that we have that's out there anyway. And when you talk about like that cultural suppression, it's okay to talk about a black woman in a derogatory way in our music, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything, it's like, it's, it's sex. It's about sex, right? But black women. But then when we lift our voices, like you are doing now, to empower and we're taking back control to say, yeah, it's okay. I am going to portray myself as this sexy, beautiful, amazing, alluring woman. Really I, think, I, I think our approach towards like issues to do with sex, mm -hmm. whether from a young age or the older that you get and how it's just like, oh no, this is a very secretive thing that only happens in the back door. That's why any harm that happens that involves sex is a backdoor conversation instead of come in front, you know, and it's like, oh, we, we just, we just don't talk about it. Um, this is just something that's unheard of, you know, just go talk to your therapist and it's, it's just like hide it. It's like, always close the door and talk about it in a closed doors whether it's a celebration of it whether it's like oh yeah like I'm a sexy person and I love um that's also kind of like oh as a black woman like hide that like always hide that always carry yourself like headstrong you know like there's always a way that you need to act but like you know a man would probably just say yeah I slept with that one and I did and it's like I can't talk of, well, the sex that happened, really, I didn't want to have yeah. sex. Yes, I went back home with this person and it was a night out. I was drunk, but I didn't, I'd say no, but well, it's expected behind the closed doors to just, well, you had your boobs out. So I guess you consented. Like the conversations that I needed to be had a close. I remember being young and everybody mentioning how 
there's certain things I needed to do for my husband to be happy when I get older. And I'm like, okay, why is this conversation okay to have? But the conversation around the harm that could happen is a taboo to be talked about. I don't understand. Like, shouldn't that go hand in hand? Like, shouldn't I understand the positive and the negative of what's going on? Or with my body, how my body would feel if it's a good feeling of touch and how my body would feel if harm is happening towards it. Like, because not all touch is good touch. And I think there needs to be, because it's like really alarming when you look at the statistics of um, black women that's been harmed, right? These deviant behaviors against black women, right? Um, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics uh, in 2003, right? They said for every black woman who reports rape, at least 15 black women do not report it. And it goes back to how our voices are suppressed, how we're not encouraged to talk about this. It's it's almost like the society condones it to an extent mm -hmm. that it's okay for men to treat us a certain way. You know what? Because our skirts were too short. We were wearing red lipstick mm -hmm. or we were too flirtatious. Like, yeah. you know, and it's the programming. And it dates back to slavery, even before slavery, right? Because Black women, we were just to be of service. Our slave masters, they raped us. We didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And there is also that conversation around consent. What does consent mean? And even the definition of what rape is. Mm -hmm. So we have like, you know, historians like Estella Friedman, like she wrote a book. I just started reading that book. It's called Redefining Rape, Sexual Violence in the Area of Suffrage and Segregation, right? And yeah. she's breaking it down like, you know what, you know, how are black women how are we gonna to get to this point where we do have a voice, where we feel empowered, where we push back and say, hey, no, this is not right. But then it goes back to even the political system. So help me and for viewers who are listening, the healing process, mm. what does that look like for you? I think when it comes to the healing process, it looks different for, you know, each individual, right? I come from a culture and love my culture, which celebrates women, but at the same time, it's like, shoo, 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 keep quiet, like, don't, don't talk about that. Um, I had to realize that I needed to speak up, like, speaking up was a huge part of realizing that what happened to me was not my fault. And it had nothing to do with the fact that I have, I, I look good in a dress. It had nothing to do with that. And so for me, my healing process started off with, I need to speak up. This, this was, and this was not good. What happened to me was not right. Um, and at first speaking up looked like writing a song. I wrote songs and I sang to, to songs, you know, poetry was also one of those things that's like, you know what, I can express myself and nobody's gonna ask and be like, oh, is this your story? Because people are so, so interested to just tell me the painful part of the story. And I'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And it's like, whoa, 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 hold on. Um, because the healing journey is like really it's a one step at a time you you just don't go to college and be like yeah i got my degree the next day it's there's a first year the second year all that stuff it's like stages and phases that you have to go through um to go through your healing journey and how that looks like for you the moment that you put back the shame towards the perpetrator whoever that was whether you knew the person um or not like that's an important aspect and going back to like something that you mentioned like the stereotypes that um are there for black women like strong black women it's it's known that we're we're really strong we have a threshold for pain you know like we 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 can take it um and to be like oh no i i i was harmed like sexually harmed or sexually trafficked or raped like that's kind of like 
didn't you want that? Like, are you sure, like with how strong you are, are you sure that happened to you? And we put that on us, ourselves too. We start thinking, but I'm strong. Like, how did I let that happen? Like, you know, and just realizing that you are deserving of like the help when you need help. Um, and what happened to you was bad, like acknowledging that for yourself as well, because the world keeps telling you that there's no way that happened. It is important for you to remind yourself of the truth of what actually happened, because a few people are going to come and stand for you, but um, some might, might not. So it's important to just be like, what is the truth of the situation? And you know how your body feels when you feel good. And you know how your body feels when you don't. And that's something that it's like important to be like, okay, I really didn't feel good during this. And this was harmful. And it's okay for me to say it out loud that you harmed me. We, we have a system of also protecting, you know. And um, I remember with my first rape, I protected my rapist because it felt... It, it just felt like, oh my God, you're gonna go to jail. You can. It's just so much, and I'm gonna be at fault. I'll be the one that said something, and I just protected the person because it felt like the right thing um, to do. While it wasn't. In our black culture, we have secrets. We have. Oh, we have secrets. So we can talk about them. <laughs> what was this like for your family? when you decided to be open about what's happening to you? Oh, it was such, um, they were not happy with it. They they couldn't really voice it out. Like it was a very shush conversation. Like just under the covers at the, at the house. We didn't even talk about it in the house. It just happened. Okay, we move on. Um, but then when I started speaking up about it, it was just like, well, people are gonna hear you. Like, why would you do that? You know, to yourself, your future, your, um, you know, your future partner, how are they going to see, you know, how would they look at you? And yeah, secrets, secrets protect not only, they, secrets protect the perpetrator in as much as we think it's protecting the person who's gone through the hurt it isn't it's actually protecting the other person um and so the more i spoke about it i think my family actually came around and started speaking about how that time was hard for them as well because when rape happens um, like sexual trauma, any type of sexual trauma happens, it just doesn't affect the, the person that it happens to. It affects every person that's connected to them in some way. And since everything was now out in the open, I could hear from, you know, my mom just being like, it was kind of hard to be intimate with your father um, after that happened. Because I'm just thinking a man like you did something to my daughter. And it's like, oh, that's real. Like, that's real things that we should talk about um that's something that now i can look at my ancestor and say hey like really you could you could wear your crop top you could wear your shirt like just express yourself and honestly it has nothing to do with your clothes and i don't have to hide myself so that means you don't have to hide yourself um so it took it it took some time they weren't on board um but now they're kind of like oh we see the point. We, we we get it now. Got it. And now you go around the world. You volunteer. You share your story. There is so much power in our stories, right? Um, talk to me about one of your most liberating moments where you were volunteering. Like, can you share, give us some insights with that? One moment I was volunteer. Oh, I lead a lot of spoken word workshops. And one time I was leading a spoken word workshop and somebody just got to a place where she wrote, she finally expressed what happened for her and how she felt so strong after that. Like, oh, wow. Like, yeah, this is not a shameful thing like this the shame is really not mine to hold and to carry um 
it's it's like the perpetrators on that moment for me was like oh cool yes it is not your own and that happened recent which was like last year so these moments for me where i've run spoken word or have conversations with the next person about sex and they don't get shocked is always like oh i like this you understand that you're a sexual being it's fine it, it's it's completely fine and we can talk about what's good what it's not because i know for a fact i only learned in my like when i got older what an orgasm is and i am deserving of an orgasm while i thought it was just for my partners or you know the men like the the men are the ones that need to experience this that's why it was easy for my body to just be like oh yeah this my body is not my own my body is for the next person and whatever they do with it it's like as long as they're happy and so i've been having getting past that of oh, my body is for the next person and and seeing my body is my body is mine it's it's really mine and when i'm having conversations with people it's like oh yeah like this is mine so when i'm ready i'm ready and if i'm not i'm able to be like no 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 this is like off balance applications to be put in like and those moments are exciting for me it's like you realize that no one has the right to do anything to you without your permission and if they do then you can like put it in your book to say this was wrong and this is not right um you can identify that at first i did not know how to identify it because i didn't even know that i could speak about the good parts of it yeah. again it's been able to name what it is that we're feeling mm -hmm. but it's so hard for us to identify and i'll use us because i want to normalize here tonight the power of owning who we are as sexual mm -hmm. beings, as women, right? Owning our orgasms, right? And mm -hmm. orgasms, 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 and pleasure and pleasure and sex, right? Yeah. We got to normalize that for our younger generation that's coming up, right? And for the older generation as well, right? Because to this day, I still get that feedback where people look at me, well, my alter ego, Toya, when I go in and I, I, I just free myself and I take myself to the next level. And I guess it's because I'm so in touch with my sexuality mm. and it's something that we are not taught of. Um, can you probably share some insights about what does pleasure look like after sexual trauma? Mm. That's, that's interesting. Pleasure after sexual trauma looks like power within yourself, like being able to like grab onto it and know that you are not helpless anymore. You can make that decision for yourself and you matter in this, in this moment, like all the words of, Oh my God, like it's all about the other person after sexual trauma. There's a, there's a lot of feeling of helplessness because power was taken away from you. Um, and that's a helpless feeling. And pleasure after sexual trauma, like, is you regaining that back, regaining um, your power, regaining what you feel about your body, the thoughts that you have towards your body and how you dress and all that stuff is really creating... Um, an identity for yourself apart from, you know, all the things that people said about you, the bad things that they said, or the expectations that after sexual trauma, you can't um, enjoy yourself or you can't like yourself or you can't look at yourself in the mirror. And, and those moments happen where you, after sexual trauma, you look at yourself, like you have triggers. There are moments where you're triggered. You're triggered by somebody even like touching your shoulder and, coming to a point where you're very uh, sexually aware um, is important because then you know what are the boundaries that you have towards your body and, you know, and uh, what do you allow, what do you not allow? Um, and it takes some time. 
And it's just realizing that you got to have to be patient and graceful towards yourself because some days it's like, yes, I'm on, I'm ready. And then some days it's like, oh my God, don't come near me. And those, all those days are okay. Like there's two sides to a coin and there's two sides to you in that, in your healing process. It's not, you're always like, I am sexy. Then days where you don't feel sexy and sit with yourself to just be like okay i need to process i need to process what i feel i need to process who the energy i allow in my life and the people i connect with it matters who you connect with in those moments and um i think i would just say remember that in in your you know like getting better um sense sexually you have to feel safe safety is a huge, huge thing. So identify what safety looks like for you and work with that as your boundary, as you have to make sure you feel safe because if you're triggered, then it's like weeks or months of feeling a certain way. So safety matters. Um, so first in your healing journey, identify that. And then sexual pleasure after that is like, oh, in the premise of I feel safe, I feel sexy, I like myself, and I am deciding to do this, not it's being done to me. Got it. At what point do you share with your, like just from your experience and probably other women that you've been around and hearing these stories, right? At what point do you share this with your potential partner? Mm -hmm. I used to feel the need to always to to always say it like oh just just so you know in case I get a trigger and that you you have to you know prove that you're safe and I realized that that's I still was giving power to the next person it, it is in your power to make me feel safe if, in case you trigger me in case um, and I, I really think it is your story to tell if you want to share it with a partner, if you feel safe enough to even tell them, if um, it could happen in, in a few weeks, in a few months, whatever that looks like for you, but like, it is actually not, um, I don't think it's a requirement that you have to constantly just like go and say, I think it really matters where you are in your journey. And if you think that is even something that's required to share, I think at some point a safety builds it will come up, right, in a conversation. I think this this was something I was even talking to my friend about. It's we never really talk about what do I want uh, sexually? Like, how do I want to be touched? How don't I want to be touched? Like, I would say, for example, my first rape experience, I was choked. And for me now, it's like, if you choke me, I will slap you don't do that so let's talk about like what and what not can happen um maybe in those conversations at some point when you feel safe you could be like oh you know what talking is not for me you know, because it brings up some memories and and when i'm ready to share what memories it brings up like i'll bring it up but it's really totally up to you don't feel pressured or the need to share your story it's it's yours and however way um you come to that decision it's really up to you awesome so james baldwin um he once said to accept one's past one's history is not the same thing as drowning in it mm -hmm. it's learning how to use it exactly and I see that you have done a phenomenal job with that. Thank you. But I think for me, and like I shared the stats just now with black women, and I think about our black girls who are consistently being exposed to that. I'm a social worker, I work in child welfare, see it all the time, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's still a struggle. Mm -hmm. um, what suggestion, what recommendations, um, you know, and we could have conversations about what this could look like. Do you suggest, how do we open this conversation? How do we allow people to feel comfortable? Because mm. they're really uncomfortable with having these conversations, but it's such a needed conversation because we could prevent 
someone being sexually abused and mm -hmm. or giving someone that power if something happens to be able to talk about it and know yeah. it's okay. I think it's so important for us who are like in a position where we're able to share. Like I'm, I'm ready. I would talk about it. I, I called my sister one time, my baby sister and said, oh, we're talking about sex today. And she was like, why? She was so shocked. Like, why are you talking to me about this? I said, girl, you 18 and we're getting older. We're in college. Like, we, ha we have to talk about this because the information you'll be getting is from, you know, like young people. And it's like, well, y'all do not know, know better. So it, it matters that we are open to the people that we're connected to, like the young ones. Like if you are leading a group of teenagers, like it matters sharing with them. If you are comfortable, like if you're in a good space, um, like share with them and then they'll feel open to open up. It, it, it doesn't happen in one day, but let's start these conversations and have honest conversations as well with our friends, our families on how rape looks like. Like it's not, um, we have this idea that sexual violence will only happen from somebody we don't know and never it can happen in the same household. And um, because we don't talk about that, people don't feel the need or or feel safe enough to come and report to us or be like, oh, this has been happening. This person is touching me inappropriate. Even certain phrases in cultures that we've used for a very long time, like sit on your uncle's laps to say hi. Like we've normalized such things where it's like, you don't know how safe the new uncle, whoever that is, is. And, but it's just like, no, but the kid, because you are the child, you have to accept everything we say. And like, how can we, we need to have conversations on how the rights that the, that our kids have and how they can tell us if they feel unsafe. Um, so to be honest, it might be a few people talking about it, but if you're talking about it, keep talking about it and more people will come and join it. It's, it's like that. It's like a, it's our whole movement. It, it starts slowly, but surely. Um, and share, share what works for you, what doesn't. How, how have, have you, Marie, you know, even come up to Toya J? How did Toya J come up? And um, what, you know, like how, how that makes you feel and it is important for them to see how happy and how you embrace your body, how you embrace your sexuality for them to also be like, Oh, it's, it's possible. I mean, it's hard to believe something that you can't see. So for people who are open about it, like actually leave it. And, um, people are always going to follow at some point they will catch up. So do, do your part. I think every person has a part to play. Um, so yeah. And if I hear you correctly, you basically, it's about communication. It's about sharing, right? And it's also about, um, we are what we carry, yeah. right? So we also have to be super mindful and so conscious of what we're taking on. And it's a lot of unlearning that we have to do. Because like you said, you know, it's okay. Like you can sit on that uncle's lap. Like how safe is this uncle? And I think it's like such a myth that, it doesn't happen in your, it's always in your house. It's always someone familiar because that's like the grooming stage. Because mm -hmm. sometimes these perpetrators, they've been watching you and preparing you for- Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh, I see your, 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 t your, your tits are now bigger. And it's like, <laughs> like, wait, how, what, what? That's what you've been looking at? Like, how did you know they're bigger now? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, that's it's it's I think for me I'm so baffled by this right um we're in 2023 we're in day 10 2023 and you and I we're having this conversation and it feels almost archaic like you know like why are women why are black women still going through this why is it that we're often ridiculed you know and this is like a perfect segue to talk about 
the power of arts, right? Right? We don't go there and women like us who are so bold and who are comfortable talking about sexuality and sharing who we are, we're often ridiculed. It's so much literature out there that talks about how black women, how our voices, our sexual voices are suppressed. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever had or felt, had an experience where you feel as if like your voice in your art, quote unquote, is being directed in a way that does not belong to you? Mm. I think at first when I was getting into spoken word and just um, music as well, I wanted more to impress the public and I wanted to still be the ideal girl, the ideal woman. Like I should just write, I should be, you know, provocative enough, but like um, not too much. Like I was putting myself under the same pressure and until I realized that no, I actually want to write from a place that brings healing towards myself. It was, imp I switched how I wrote my spoken word. I switched how I wrote my music or how I danced and the videos I'll post about me dancing. Like it, it became about, oh, this is how I release stress. This is how I celebrate myself. And this is the message I want to say. This is something I want to share or I'm angry about. And um, so since then, I had the pressure and it made me stop writing or even sharing or I was just like in my own cocoon like I would think about things but I would never share and until I realized that I wanted to write from a place that brought healing towards myself and what mattered was me um, in this moment and anybody who can relate to me it changed how I approached my art um, so technically haven't felt that way since I like got into it. I got into it and I was like, this is it. This, we, we love this, we love, we love us. <laughs> so, yeah. and um, it's been great because I got into just connect with the young girls who feel the same way or are trying to figure out life after sexual violence. And I'm like, cool, then you are my audience and this is good, this is fine for me. This is the audience I want. And yeah, we move, we move from there. And anyone else has their own lane. We can all shine in our own lens. I just cannot hold myself captive to an audience that actually maybe was not even mine to begin with. I love that you say that. Do you have a philosophy that you live by? God, definitely. Um, my reaction towards things was always on shame. Everything that happened, I'd, my first reaction would be shame. And now what I live by is understanding I'm a powerhouse and however that looks like. A powerhouse one day could feel a little low and it's fine. That does not change the fact that I'm strong. That does not change what I bring. That does not change anything about me. So I've just come to accept that Hey, I'm a powerhouse and some days some people are going to be intimidated and, and some and, and being a black woman too it's like the word of intimidation like oh no I can't speak up so loud because you're going to think I'm intimidating or aggressive or aggressive or however way like you're going to come up with something because I am a black woman you will come up with something one way or another and um but in this moment I am a powerhouse I live for it and I'm happy about it so Matt is saying he hopes that he could hear our poem before we end. Is that possible? Oh, wow. I need to go through um, the spot. <laughs> I'm oh, like, yeah. oh, I did not expect that. Um, and while you figure that out, like, you know, I just want to uh, do a quick, quick summary of what we've been talking about here. Um, Cause this is such a, a, a much needed conversation. Um, yeah understand that it's not your fault mm -hmm. understand that no is no i don't no. care if this woman took her clothes off but the <laughs> moment you're about to penetrate her and she mm -hmm. says no 
that's an act of rape. You have to stop. It's yeah. our body. We decide. It's not for you to decide because we were too sexy. We smiled mm -hmm. too much. You too thought much. too provocative or too flirtatious. It doesn't, no means no. It's really that simple. And also for women to remember, you have the power to heal yourself. And this myth of what a strong Black woman is, that we were programmed to believe, that you don't feel pain. For me, yeah. I learned later in my years that a strong Black woman is a woman who is able to admit, to name what it is that she's feeling, and to say, today, I need help. Yeah. The help that you need. That, for me, is the definition of what a strong Black woman. I love. I like that. We deserve help. Yeah. We deserve a soft life. Yes. yes. <laughs> we don't so always. We don't always. Right? Absolutely. Um, I have found a spoken word, and um, it's called daughter. And I think sometimes when we talk about issues around sex and um, sexual violence, everyone would be like, oh, no, I would never do that to my daughter or my sister. And it's like we only notice somebody as when we want to only protect somebody when they're family. Like it feels like that's the only boundary. And it's it's like this person in the road, the person that you want to, you want to penetrate without, even when they say no, could be your family and um and how can we just look at everyone and just respect them the same respect their no respect their yes um so yeah i was not expecting this i am so my i'm a fine <laughs> <laughs> okay um i'm looking for my daughter it dawned on me late that daughter is not only the one I birthed myself, daughter exists everywhere around me. And I convinced myself that blood is thicker. So I sat, pat myself on the back and pretended you weren't my own. Then I found you. You looked me in my eye and so you needed help. I made your story about me stroking my ego because extending my hand made me a good person and not about mending the broken world that I let you navigate alone because, hey, you are not blood, you are water. I felt to see you past your experience because it was weird to think of you as more than that. Centralized your story because pitying you was easier to comprehend than noticing the part I played. I see that your story is a reminder of the bondage that robbed you of your freedom, sundered you of the life you dreamt of, that your desire for independence is you reclaiming your name and the years that you lost. See, you are a woman with passion, dreams, seeking to find stability, reclaiming her virtue and starting her life. Despite all the hurt, you laugh the hardest. You are a lotus, growing so beautifully in this messed up world. You extend of you extend yourself. May I give you power? May my support give you the chance to explore opportunities that help you rebuild. I am sorry it took me this long to see that daughter. Blood and water are equally as important. If I ever doubt that. Let's see how I feel if I go a day without water. Wow. That is an interesting piece. I was not prepared, but... <laughs> you know what? It's okay. This is the bold show. Anything this goes. This is the bold show. I love this it. I Anything live goes. for it. <laughs> you know, um, just listening to you, like Toya J is like really acting up. I'm trying to tell her to be quiet right now. <laughs> Want to see Toy J? We want to see Toy J all day every day. <laughs> Toy J is acting out, but you know, like listening to that piece just now, I could hear the safeness in it. Because again, it's society is telling us how we should show up, mm -hmm. and I think as um, as artists, right, it takes a while for us to become in ourselves and to own our art, right. Yeah. It takes a while for us to get there. But before we, because we're coming close to the end, right? 
And I have a piece I think I want to read. It's, I think it's really fitting. Um, let me see, yeah. It's from my book called Tease. And I think from Toya J's book called Tease. I'm excited. No means no. When she says no, let her be. Do not allow your ego to influence your actions. It's her body, her right to decide, to consent or not. Her vulnerability does not mean yes. Skimply dressed, it's not an invitation to violate, be non-judgmental. Your perception does not give you the right to decide for her. Her silence is not a yes. Drunk yes is impaired. Red lips, pink lips, it's not a request for interaction. It's no, let her be. Stop. Don't mm -hmm. make a conjecture. It's her body. P.S. No means no. Do not violate, even if it's your wife. No means no. Oh, even if it's your wife. I like that. Even if it's your wife. Yeah. That's um, this, we need a part two for this conversation. We right? do. <laughs> because there is so much to talk about. There's so much to talk about how, as Black women, we are subjects. Mm. And we are thought how to feel, how to act, how to show up in spaces. Yes. But like you all heard Jean tonight, right? She is a powerhouse. We're all powerhouses. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need to have like a sisterhood. And mm -hmm. we're normalizing. It's so not okay. I could go outside butt naked if I choose to. I'm not going to do it because I probably end up in a mental house, right? I'm not going <laughs> to do that. But the point I'm trying to make, it's like, it really is okay for us to show up as our authentic selves, mm -hmm. not the watered down version. So yeah. are there any projects you have that's lurking on the horizon in the near future? Um, so definitely my YouTube um, channel is going back up. Uh, it's been a few months but you can definitely go and check out Jean Anguada. And I speak about cultures that needs to change. But the next segment is going to strictly be how exploring life after sexual violence. And I'm super, super excited about it because it's how I reclaim myself. I reclaim my vagina, like, because it's powerful. And like, we'll say the word and over and over. Um, so please check it out. That's definitely going to go up pretty soon. I'm super excited for that project and just really talking to people like you, you know, and sharing from their own perspective. It's, it's, I'm excited. I love it. The power of the vagina, right? We're ready. <laughs> well, I want you to finish this statement. For me, Jean is blank. What's your blank? It goes back to, for me, Jean is powerful. God. Powerful. I, the experience makes you feel like you can never be anything more. My experience made me feel like I was just less than for so long. And I realized that that was a lie. It is. We are not our past. Definitely not. And the beauty about being a human being is that we get to correct our past. Right? We get yeah. to write it, right? Mm -hmm. we, we are the directors. We are in charge of our lives. Mm -hmm. But like James Baldwin said, we have to make a conscious decision. Are we going to allow that negative past experience to suppress and control who we are? Mm. Before we close out, is there any message? What would you like to leave the viewers? And tell us where we could contact you if they my message is definitely show up as your authentic self because people are going to say something either way. And when you've gone through something, remember that the shame, any harm that has been caused on you, the shame does not belong to you. So you don't have to sit in it, live in it and walk with your head down. Give it back to the rightful owner, which is not you. It's the person that caused the harm um, towards you. And so where you can find me is jean.nangwala on Instagram and jean.nangwala on YouTube. 
Thank you so much for this much needed conversation. And like I said, I think we need to have a part two of this where we dive deeper into conversations about real, about sex, yeah. right? Um, we have to normalize sex, vagina, pleasure, orgasm, all of that stuff. We got to take back our power. And for our little girls out there that's coming up, or little black girls, we want them to realize there is so much power in the pussy. It really is okay. Mm -hmm. And don't own it. It's not yours. It's not your fault. You didn't uh, ask to be hurt. You did not. We, we should not take control over the bad behaviors of others towards us. Mm -hmm. But it was certainly a pleasure having this conversation with you tonight. Thank you so much Thank for you. being willing to be uh, so vulnerable. That vulnerability means so much. And I feel honored. Thank you for Thank having you me. so much. It was, awesome. it was such a pleasure. And just remember, you're awesome. I am awesome. We are awesome. And we are trailblazers. Have a awesome. great evening, everyone. Bye. Or else the world will knock you out. I knew the world wouldn't protect me, so I learned to keep my guard up. But one place that felt I didn't have to have my guard up was in the church. I thought no one would ever harm me. Everyone is trustworthy and safe. So my God was all the way down when he invited me to his place. He was admirable. He loved the Lord. He sang. He preached. He was noble. Everything my mama told me that were qualities of a good man. He was safe. I thought but there he was his hands on me I said no but he was right there on top of me pulling at my skirt I became 13 again powerless again should I fight back I was shocked last time I tried should I say no again maybe he did not hear me the first time I thought but here I am, laying here like wood. It will be over soon, I told myself. Just breathe. It will be over soon. He was. Done. He got up and left me. So hey, when you saw me at church the next day, angry and afraid you ignored me i wish you looked at me a little longer because you would have seen the sadness in my eyes my sadness said more than my words could ever express my tears my self-sabotaging behavior that you say it was unlike me was a cry for help but instead you excluded me because that is not what a child of God does. I wish your prayer was not a one-time occurrence that hit me with shame because my hurt didn't wash away immediately. I wish it was like a river flowing with patience and kindness. You were supposed to be my safe space. So I need you to understand that I could trust you again. I wish you could acknowledge that you have been in an entangled relationship with a system that continues to save face instead of undoing the hurt. Power is used to manipulate instead of inspire. Religion to harm instead of heal. Something needs to change change so is this church a safe space for me oh is that just a children's tale <laughs>